Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to this joint PB and AM webinar session. My name is Georgia. I'm editor of Aesthetic Medicine and I'm joined by Dr. Nick Lowe. Um, Nick is a consultant dermatologist at the Cranley Clinic in London and also clinical professor at UCLA um, in the States. So thank you for joining us, Nick. Yeah, thanks very much, Georgia. Nice to be here. Lovely to have you. Um, so we're talking all about eczema this morning. Um, we, so Nick has a, a presentation planned for us. I'm going to start sharing my screen just in a second. I know a few more people are just coming in. Um, so what we'll do is if anyone has any questions for Nick, if you just want to drop them in the uh, chat box on here, then after the presentation, I'll come back on and we'll go through the questions and we'll do a bit of a, a, a Q&A session at the end. So... I think if we just get set up as a few more people come in and um, I'm going to be screen sharing from my end. So I will, um, let me start sharing. Okay, cool. I think we should be good to go. So I'm just going to get my... Oh, okay. Screen sharing doesn't seem to be working. Just bear with me one second. I'm just going to send a message. Um, sorry, just bear with me, everyone. Sorry, I'm just being transferred over to host and then I should be able to share my screen. I'm happy to start talking if you want to uh, yeah, let me do that. Yeah, you give us so a bit of they, they can, they, Everyone can hear me, can't they, Georgia? Yeah, you should. Yeah. No. Great. Well, yeah, eczemas uh, uh, are an interesting and extremely important common skin condition that actually dermatologists find is one of the most common skin problems. The two probably the most frequent skin problems we see. One is um, acne and the other is uh, the eczemas. The reason it's important for aestheticians and aesthetic clinics is because, as I will point out, uh, A, uh, you can find that some patients who have a tendency or a susceptibility to eczema can be made worse by certain aesthetic treatments. We have to modify them uh, to avoid that or avoid them in some cases. And the other important thing as regards aesthetic uh, clinics is that many of us who work in aesthetic clinics can actually have a higher incidence of getting eczemas themselves, particularly on the hands and exposed skin. So those are the important uh, reasons uh, why I thought eczemas were an important subject to, to cover. So let's uh, go through. So this was my first slide, so go to the next slide. I'm just going to uh, stop my video. Great. So yeah, so uh, there's many different types of eczema, as this slide shows. The most common are what we call childhood or atopic eczema, or the adults with atopic. What atopy or atopic means is that there's an inherited tendency to be sensitive. Uh, uh, skin eczema, it's associated with asthma, hay fever, and so we call that uh, group of conditions atopy. And it's an allergic reaction but it's a, a, an inborn error, if you will, of immune response. Then you have the other important things as regards aesthetic clinics, and that's um, allergic eczemas and also irritant eczemas. Uh, these are exposure to certain uh, uh, chemicals, gloves, uh, products that can actually trigger that uh, eczema in the susceptible person. And then there's the other groups where seborrheic eczema, which I'll elaborate on a little bit more, face, 
particularly in scalp, so it's a, quite a frequent thing that you will see in the aesthetic clinic. And then hand uh, eczema and eczema drug reaction. So there's a number of different uh, types of eczema and the dermatologist has to be uh, somewhat of a detective when we're uh, diagnosing the correct type of eczema. Next slide. So as regards atopic eczemas, as you see here, it's a very frequent problem. Uh, probably up to at least 20% of the population worldwide uh, are affected. Um, in childhood atopic, that's the onset, the most common type of onset, it can start anywhere from the early uh, postnatal time uh, to actually uh, months uh, or 10 years or more. Then there's an, the other group, which are the adult onset atopics. And that is where literally you have an onset in later life of the same type of atopic eczema, where there's an uh, abnormality within your skin. And this can start anywhere between teenage and 20 years of age. Um, and it's interesting that, in fact, some children which have gone into what we call remission in childhood from atopic eczema uh, may recur with their eczema when they're older. So this is quite uh, a frequent um, occurrence and it's something that with a careful history you can uh, you can um, uh, uh, observe. Hand eczemas particularly um, in adults usually often as a result of occupation um, certainly the uh, hand dermatitis of uh, hairdressers of some aestheticians uh, some physicians um, and particularly important nowadays with COVID-19 is the frequent hand washing uh, and cleansing that will precipitate or increase the problems of hand eczema. So we can talk about that more later. Next slide. By the way, write down any questions and uh, I'll be happy to uh, try and answer them at the end uh, and any comments. So what do actually eczema show as uh, their symptoms, the eczema uh, sufferer, the eczema patients? Well, interestingly, lots of studies have uh, shown that you can, uh, I have a, a hand eczema and I know when that uh, eczema is going to start because I get itching of the hands before I actually see a skin rash. This is particularly frequent. So you'll often get the person will tell you I've got this itching burning sensation and then a few days or hours later uh, the eczema rash will start. The other interesting thing is that the, you get a much higher incidence of sensitive skin uh, in people with a history of a, atopic eczema. And why is this is important? Well a lot of our products uh, that we uh, use in aesthetic clinics or we recommend or the, our uh, patients buy uh, it will create sensitive skin and I'll come back onto that in a moment. So we need to know that because we need to be very much more selective about uh, which products we recommend. And then going on to when the rash starts. Eczema, by the way, is taken from the um, Greek word exio, which means I bubble over. And you often get, in addition to redness, these tiny little water blisters or bubbles uh, that we call vesicles in the skin. So that's part of the severe uh, skin rash. And the other problems, of course, with, uh, with kids and uh, adults with atopic eczema is sleep deprivation, the itching that keeps them awake at night, the burning of the skin. Uh, it can have a major impact on the uh, overall quality of life, of the, uh, of the uh, sleep, the tiredness, but also social lives uh, can be significantly affected by eczema. Next slide. This is a typical uh, picture of, uh, this happens to be a child with early acute uh, eczema, atopic eczema. It's the inner aspects of the elbows or knees that are frequently the early case. And you see this uh, redness of the skin. The skin often reacts when you scratch it gently. Uh, with changing color. It often goes white. We call white dermographism. The other important thing to look at on this photograph is just 
in the middle of the photograph, you can see very prominent blood vessels showing through, veins throwing through. And this is because this patient has been, as many have to be, treated with topical cortisone creams. Unfortunately, they control the eczema, but they unfortunately also uh, create thinning of the skin or what we call steroid atrophy. Next slide. So in the acute stages, you get the redness, you get the little vesicles or blisters. Uh, and uh, then at a, as the eczema goes on, and if it's not controlled, you get the more subacute, where you've got more of the redness, the fissures, the breaking of the skin, the cracking. This is where it can become very, very uh, disabling, particularly in areas that are painful, like the hands and the skin folds. And then when it's more chronic, you get this thickened scale uh, where we call lichenification. Next slide. And why does this inflammation occur? It, it occurs because we know that the skin barrier in eczema, atopic eczema, is, is actually relatively inefficient and it allows uh, triggers for the eczema that we call allergens to actually penetrate through that impaired skin barrier. And that then presents themselves to a variety of cells in the skin that create the inflammatory production or the inflammatory cascade that creates the redness, the burning, the itching, and this whole cascade then results in the onset or worsening of eczema. Next slide. And this is uh, what I've said, uh, the, one of the previous slides, this is an example of subacute eczema, uh, where you've actually got uh, quite significant redness, erythema still remaining, you've got the start of thickened uh, skin, the scale, but you've also got the breaks in the skin, the fissures, and it's at this stage where the several concerns, the pain, the irritancy, also the increased risk of infection. And as you can obviously see here, the skin barrier is severely affected. Uh, um, and so uh, these are all concerns as the eczema pr proceeds into the subacute stage. Next slide. And this is the more chronic stage where I'm sure many of us have seen this in patients where you've got this long-standing eczema often in areas behind the knees, on the front of the legs, on the elbows, the arms. Uh, it's made worse by rubbing and scratching, which is an inevitable part of eczema. Unfortunately, that is one of the uh, problems of eczema is the intense itching that rubs. You get into this cycle of what we call scratch itch cycle and lichenification. So those are examples of uh, the different stages of eczema. Next slide. And another type of eczema that I mentioned that we'll, you'll see in, uh, in the aesthetic clinic is the patient who has this uh, red scaling, um, quite annoyingly disfiguring picture on the face, often in the scalp of seborrheic eczema. Um, it can often be um, misdiagnosed as rosacea. Interestingly, it actually coexists in many, certainly of patients, where I see it frequently, where you have this overlap of uh, and coexistence of seborrheic eczema on the face with rosacea, and the two can often go along together. And I'll talk about why this may be. One of the reasons may be that when, uh, say, a hydrocortisone cream is used on the seborrheic eczema of the face, it may control partly the eczema, but then it may precipitate the risk for uh, rosacea. But this is something that we can treat um, very easy, readily with a number of different uh, products. One of the triggers is the surface yeast called spit pitorosporum. And in the susceptible patients, uh, this will trigger the uh, seborrheic eczema with erythema and scale. And it, interestingly, there's always uh, an increased incidence of atopic history in people frequently with seborrheic eczema. Next slide. So why does eczema occur? I have mentioned that the poor skin barrier function is one of the keys to uh, eczema. It allows irritants and allergens to penetrate into the skin and create the inflammatory cascade. Skin sensitivity is increased in most eczema patients. So you get the burning and itching and 
this is why you have a poor tolerance to topical products and foods. Uh, for example, acidic foods like citrus, uh, lemons, oranges can sometimes create problems for our patients. I'll just turn my phone off. Um, soaps and detergents can all damage the skin barrier further and uh, will worsen or start the eczema. And then cosmetics, makeups, hair products, some clothing, again, may all, way, all worsen the eczema. So this is where, as an aesthetic clinic, we can often, um, you can often help to uh, advise patients uh, if they have this recurring eczema in certain places. And I'll detail that in, a, in the next few slides. Next slide. So what are some of the at-risk products and treatments that um, uh, aesthetic clinics can basically make eczema worse or, or provoke eczema? So topical products, and some are, are actually very frequent in the worsening or precipitation of eczema in the eczema-prone subjects, patients. Topical retinoids, retinoic acid, retinol, of which a lot of our products contain retinol, uh, the reason that they make the eczema worse is because they further change the skin barrier, they stimulate the skin cells to be turning over more quickly, and the outer skin, the outer stratum corneum, the epidermal cells in the stratum corneum do not uh, develop as mature and effective a skin barrier if they're being treated with retinoids. Glycolic acids are very similar. Salicylic acid is very similar. So those type of products can create further injury, if you will, to the skin barrier. It doesn't mean you have to avoid them altogether. What it does mean is you need to generally start with the mildest strength and you need to start with a little test area. I will often get them to use a little test area often behind the ear for a few days before they start using it on more uh, larger areas of the skin and also make sure that they start doing it maybe every second day or night and that they use a good moisturizing wash or moisturizer uh, between times. So those are all ways that you can reduce the um, irritancy. One of the other tricks with these in the eczema prone subjects, if you want to do it on sun damaged skin, uh, is to also get them to put on a moisturizer first, a very bland moisturizer, um, and then you can then let that soak in, let it dry, and then they can apply the uh, retinol or the mild glycolic salicylic acid on top of that. That will minimize the irritancy. Many of the anti-acne products will produce irritancy, and that includes the over-the-counter benzoyl peroxides, the salicylic acids. It's one of the reasons that uh, uh, I actually developed our own anti-acne range, which we've shown can be well tolerated uh, in eczema-prone subjects. So lots of different topical products can worsen eczema. So it's well worthwhile having a questionnaire uh, that you can go through with your patients before recommending these products. Skin lightening products can also irritate and obviously the uh, hydroquinones, but some of the others um, irritate azelaic acids, etc. You need to be very careful with your chemical peels. Uh, if you're going to do chemical peels, don't do use the harsh ones, start gently, do a test site, and if necessary, wait until anybody's eczema has calmed down before you do it. So the chemical peels, because it causes shedding and inflammation itself, uh, can create worsening eczema. Microneedling can cause uh, damage further to the skin barrier, and indeed that will uh, produce worsening eczema. And it can also give you a problem with uh, folliculitis, hair follicle infections, and uh, create a, a trigger for recurring uh, herpes simplex uh, conditions. Microblading in the same way, be careful. If you've got uh, somebody with seborrheic eczema, that can worsen the eczema. Conversely, done correctly with the right energies, uh, intense pulse lights can generally 
help to reduce the uh, inflammation, the erythema in some patients, as can some of the, and I would say low fluence um, uh, lasers that are designed like the low energy uh, ND YAG laser that we can use to reduce skin erythema, redness, they can actually sometimes help the redness of uh, certainly facial eczema. Next slide. Yeah, this is one of the risk factors, basically associated risk factors with, from aesthetic procedures. This is a picture of somebody with uh, herpes simplex, eczema herpeticum, which can become quite widespread in patients with eczema, atopic eczema. So you've got a risk of triggering this and it can become more widespread uh, with lasers, peels, and interestingly, pulse light, micro uh, uh, needling, etc. Same with folliculitis. So what I suggest doing is you take a careful history. Has the patient had any previous history of cold sores, fever, blisters? Do they have a history of eczema? And just be cautious. You can certainly advise them to get uh, a cyclovir, preferably low dose oral to help stop them if you have a, a, a concern that they may be getting herpes simplex. Next slide. So what about um, yourselves that work at the clinics? Well, in fact, there's a very high incidence of uh, hand eczema amongst uh, aesthetic uh, uh, practitioners and hairdressers uh, and physicians and surgeons. And one of the reasons, of course, that that has come to the fore is, uh, is it's one of the COVID-19 associated skin problems. And so you're going to see more of this with your frequent hand washing. Uh, I have a tendency to this, and I can tell you what I do. I uh, always have a hand wash moisturizer at the sink that I'm also using the cleansing uh, solution. So I'll put on some moisturizer first. I'll do the cleansing solution. I'll dry, and I will then put back on the hand moisturizer, uh, often before putting my gloves on. And that tends to reduce my uh, chances of getting uh, hand eczema but it is an important problem. And the other place you can get this is if you're on the face, if you're wearing masks and uh, um, face protection, like masks, for example, and some goggles will rub the skin and will also produce uh, uh, eczema on the face. And so it's important that you know that. So you can try and the best uh, way of approaching it is prevention with moisturization and some of the creams you can use cautiously uh, that I'll come on to uh, shortly. So this is an important uh, issue for, for us um, in the clinics. Next slide. So, and we are, aesthetic clinics, aesthetic practitioners are at high risk for contact dermatitis of the hands and uh, exposed skin. And the highest uh, occupation, the highest frequency is actually florists because of the high incidence of a variety of different um, plant allergens that they're exposed to. Uh, so if any of you also are keen gardeners or uh, uh, have lots of indoor plants, then just beware that uh, that could be adding to your risk. Beauty therapists certainly have a higher risk, as I mentioned. So do cooks um, and kitchen workers. And so from our perspective, that's important, hairdressers. And the reason are that these irritants and allergies are very frequent in our work. So soaps and cleansers, we've mentioned, uh, wet work, i.e. frequent wetting of the skin will damage the skin barrier further. It's important why we use protective moisturizing lotions and washes. I have no um, shares or anything or stock in it, but my favorite ones are CeraVe lotion and their products. Dermol 500, Diprobase and their products, and uh, the La Roche-Posay Gentle Cleansers, as I say. Those are some of the ones that I've found helpful for myself. Uh, preservatives, lots of the preservatives in our products can trigger contact dermatitis. Um, cosmetic ingredients, similarly. Hair products, hair dyes, shampoos, etc. very much uh, triggers. Fragrances, a high incidence of uh, re uh, allergic reactions. Sterilizing products, which again, we're going to be coming in contact more and more. 
And as I've said before, the uh, um, protective equipment that we're now having to use, masks, gloves, frequent hand washing. So all of those are very important reasons why many of you will want to uh, just be aware of that and try and prevent or reduce your problems with it. Next slide. So here we go, contact dermatitis. The important thing, if you've got an, uh, somebody that you think may have that, obviously you can refer to a dermatologist and we have ways of doing patch testing and investigating these patients. But in addition, you can go what we would do and you can also do, take a history of the occupation, the exposure history, what hobbies, have they had previous diseases, have they had past eczema, and what past treatments uh, have they had? Because one of the other key things, as we'll talk about, is some treatments, some of the ingredients, some of the preservatives in our treatment creams, in our cortisone creams, can actually trigger uh, uh, eczema, contact eczema. So all of that and the severity of the eczema and the relationship to work and play and hobbies, these are all some of the important uh, history uh, taking that, uh, that uh, I go through before deciding if somebody would benefit from patch testing, which is uh, a little inconvenient for them, but it is important where they, these suscept, uh, pa um, things that we think that the patients may be sensitive to uh, are placed on the skin, usually on the back skin in tiny little squares, and then we take them off after 24 hours, 48 hours usually, and then 72 hours, and then we examine them. And that's uh, often the clue. It, it provides the proof of, from the suspicions from the history of what particular contact uh, allergic reaction it is due to. And then they can obviously try to avoid those going forward. Next slide. So we've got lots of the, on the moving forward to the uh, treatment now and what we can do and we've got quite a number of different treatments in our dermatological armamentarium. The most effective treatments obviously have to be effective, safe. You don't want anything that uh, causes irritancy and you don't want something, anything that causes a, a rebound when you stop using it. And also they must have an absence of long-term toxicity. Next slide. And some of those current uh, eczema treatments are listed here. We mentioned emollients, moisturizers. TARS can tend not to be used now. We know that there are risks of cold TARS, which we used to use very frequently, but there are risks now that we're aware of as regards skin cancer risk. The most frequent products still used as Often first line in certain patients are cortisone creams and ointments, certainly anti-itching, antihistamines, and then a variety of newer developments of which there are non-cortisone creams that have some advantages, uh, which I will talk about, like uh, tacrolimus, hemicrolimus. I'm less of an enthusiast of chrysoboral. It causes a lot of irritancy. So I tend not to do, uh, recommend that, but certainly uh, tacrolimus permicrolimus is very useful. And then if it's very resistant and um, not responding to those types of treatments, then we can also think about local forms of ultraviolet, particularly useful for hand uh, uh, eczema. Next slide. Great, thanks. Um, and the other approach is we have to remember that when the eczema becomes more severe, we need to move on to systemic treatments. Uh, again, oral antihistamines, sometimes oral cortisones, but I will try to avoid that wherever possible. We occasionally do need to use oral cortisones. Uh, immune suppressive drugs like low doses of cyclosporin uh, have been well shown to help certain people with eczemas, severe eczemas. And the most uh, important breakthrough in recent years has been the biologic drug dupilumab, which has been shown to be highly effective, certainly in atopic uh, eczema, but also is being reported of value in certain other types of eczema. 
The other important thing, approach for the uh, patients, which I certainly follow and many of our dermatology colleagues do, and that's the holistic approach where you uh, really talk to the patients, you find out sometimes that there is a significant stress-related uh, factor, psycho talking, talking dermatology treatment, alternative therapies, I'm not a great enthusiast for herbal remedies, but some do well with it. And some people do notice that certain dietary triggers will worsen eczemas, very similarly to the inflammatory triggers of certain uh, poor high glycemic diets that can make acne worse, seem to be able to make uh, eczemas worse. Sometimes uh, sunflower seed oil, fish oils, uh, uh, some patients swear by it certain desensitization attempts which less effective but can be used and then um, taking them away from the triggers that create the eczema if you can do it uh, obviously the last two or three months i suspect many of us have not been on vacation but we have been removed from some of the triggers that have been causing our uh, eczemas or our patients uh, have been removed so uh, that certainly is, is another approach in those that are practical. Next slide. So how do we, I approach it? Well, uh, the child and uh, young adult, um, I'm a great enthusiast for things like tacrolimus, permicrolimus, their trade names are Protopic and Elidel. I don't find Chrysoboral particularly helpful. It stings a lot of patients to start with. A lot of my patients will have been also already trying uh, low strength topical cortisones like hydrocortisone, and it's important to gradually wean them off it and wean them onto these Elidel uh, protopic treatments to avoid a flare up. And then, if it's a um, child with um, uh, obviously important to instruct and reassure their parents uh, and how to uh, approach and help the child. Next slide. In the adults, again, I think the old days of occlusion wraps uh, are, are probably used much, well, definitely used much less frequently now, but we do, I do occasionally use them if somebody's got an area that has intense itching, you can break that scratch it, scratch it cycle with the uh, moisturizing uh, um, wraps, bandages that contain moisturizers, for example. Mid-potency topical steroids, high-potency topical steroids are occasionally no, uh, needed, but I will often use those in combination with the uh, Elidel uh, protopic tacrolimus permicrolimus group of creams to try and avoid over-dependency and flare-ups from, uh, from uh, the steroid. Phototherapy is another useful and, uh, treatment, as we've said before, uh, narrowband ultraviolet B, uh, we will use as dermatologists cautiously but effectively. And then we'll move on if the patient is severely affected to systemic treatments. Next slide. Topical steroids, as I say, what's one of the problems? Well, there's a few problems. One is the skin thinning and skin fragility that you get with long term use. But and there's this study um, uh, illustrates. If you stop the cortisone creams and ointments abruptly, as many patients tend to do when their eczema is apparently clear, they'll stop the cortisone and then they'll, in a week or two later or even earlier, they'll get this rebound worsening. So it's important to get them to gradually taper the treatments and make sure they're using moisturizers and emollients to try and uh, reduce that uh, relapse, that worsening. Next slide. So these, are, uh, as I say, I have no shares in these companies, but Protopic and Elidel are, are highly effective. They're now approved. They were developed originally for uh, pediatric, uh, for childhood uh, dermatitis, eczemas, and uh, they've proved to be highly effective. They're also very effective uh, on facial eczema where we don't want to uh, use uh, any or hardly any hydrocortisones or cortisone creams for the fear of creating uh, skin erythema, redness, uh, rosacea, telangiectasia, thread veins, etc. So these do not create those problems. 
very rarely you get some uh, stinging from them, but uh, usually well tolerated. Next slide. And then the more severe forms of uh, eczemas, we need to think about treating the whole patient, the whole body, uh, often the whole skin with phototherapy. UVB narrowband uh, uh, ultraviolet is helpful. Um, but more and more we've gone over to some of the systemic treatments such as cyclosporin A. Uh, systemic cortisones are certainly occasionally used, but now much less so. Uh, and uh, dupilumab, the biologic, is highly effective and is being using more and more with good safety. Um, one of the interesting things about it is that it's relatively recent introduction, but it has been uh, widely accepted by dermatologists pretty much worldwide. Next slide. And what's some information on that? It's a biologic. It targets some of the uh, triggers of inflammation in atopic eczema. It is improved in a variety of countries, ranging from childhood to adult life. And uh, it also seems to, um, uh, it, it's given by the way with the intra, um, subcutaneous small injections, which most patients will uh, be able to deliver themselves very effectively. And reassuringly seems to have long-term safety on some of the maintenance studies. One of the problems that can be of concern is uh, eye uh, side effects such as conjunctivitis. They can be managed uh, often sometimes in association combination with uh, ophthalmologists, but highly effective drug for more severe eczemas. Next slide. This just illustrates some of the points I've made, some of the uh, risk concerns and safety benefits of some of the different treatments that we have um, and uh, ranging from the risk of rebound and um, uh, relapse risk with the cortisones, the relative safety of the uh, topical um, immune suppressives like Elidel and ta uh, Tacrolimus, uh, Protopic, and uh, some of the uh, uh, details of the cyclosporin. And you can see the systemic steroids uh, do have some concerns. Next slide. Yeah, so actually the future is quite encouraging. Um, and uh, there are certainly other biologics that are now in the pipeline that will be used in addition to dupilumab. Uh, I think what's most exciting uh, from the point of view of prescription topical creams is the so-called JAK, Janus kinase inhibitors, which um, block one of the other uh, triggers for inflammation in eczemas. And there's been some recent research published, which shows one uh, listed here, uh, ruxolitinimib, that will show actually to be well tolerated and safe uh, over a, a period of time uh, uh, for eczemas. These are agents that are also used in other conditions uh, systemically for things like um, inflammatory arthritis. The other important thing to note is that what we'll also do as dermatologists is to use a combination of treatments for our patients. In other words, we'll combine low strength cortisone creams with the Elidel tacrolimus. We'll uh, use also combinations of systemic with topical, gradually reducing the systemic treatments and maintaining them on the topicals. So all of these are uh, 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 to help you be aware that we do have many different treatment options for the patients with uh, these uh, um, really uh, symptomatic and troublesome eczemas. Next slide. And that is all that I wanted to show on the slides. Thanks very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. I'll need to put my glasses on to read them. <laughs> that was brilliant. Thanks, Nick. I'm just going to um, stop sharing my screen and then. Um, OK, cool. I'm going to go through. We've got quite a few questions. Um, OK. So 
Um, someone has asked, what are your thoughts or experience about topically applied hemp CBD for eczema relief? Uh, the answer is I don't think there's been enough uh, research done to uh, confirm it. The other problem is that the CBDs uh, widely vary in their concentrations, in how they're formulated. Uh, one of the problems with many topical products for eczemas are that it depends on how the formulation is. If you've got a preservative or a uh, ingredient that can make your eczema sting or worse or create allergies, it can be a problem. Um, I, I know it's the uh, flavor of the, of the time is CBDs, and I think they have great value from some perspectives. I've yet to be, con I, we'll see. It may be uh, that there are some that prove to be useful, but I think, again, they need to be uh, carefully tested. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, yes, we will, someone's just asked, Will it be possible to have access to the recorded webinar? Yes, it will. Um, this is going to be on the AM Facebook and the PB Facebook page as well. Um, it can be downloaded, so I'll do that. And um, it, yeah, it will be available if anyone wants it. Um, uh, okay, so if you were thinking about putting a patient on antihistamines, would you look for a histamine intolerance in the patient? Uh, not really. I think the reason that we use antihistamines are several. One is that we know that there is an element to what we call uh, skin sensitivity. When, when you look at the patient with certainly atopic eczema, uh, if you s literally scratch the stroke the skin, you'll get this abnormal um, reaction that may be related to histamine release. So an early event is in some patients is related to histamine release. I think uh, the antihistamines are well worth trying and there's a lot on the market now, some of them uh, non-prescription that are non-sedating and it's very important to use non-sedating ones. Um, don't use ones that also combine the combinations with some of the uh, ephedrines, the, uh, some of the antihistamines contain ephedrine and some of the adrenaline-like uh, uh, products. Uh, don't use those if you've got eczema. But yeah, I think um, uh, certainly if the patients are itching at night, the use of a nighttime anti-itching antihistamine is well worthwhile in addition to the other treatments. Great. Um, what can be used to repair pigmentation from eczema on Asian skin? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. I didn't have time to put in uh, some how eczema affects different uh, skin of color, and it really does. One of the ways that eczema actually shows up in um, Asian or, 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 or black skin is that it doesn't show as red, it shows up as a darker purple uh, color discoloration. And so you don't actually see it as uh, redness or erythema. And if you're the dumb, uh, if the physician isn't attuned to that, they tend to miss it. But So that's one issue. And then the other issue with skin of color is, of course, that you get um, with inflammation that's chronic particularly, you can get either increased hyperpigmentation or you can get, if the damage is sufficiently severe, you can get decreased or hypopigmentation. So this is why with skin of color, I find it very important to get in to advise the patients to really get onto a treatment program that's effective. And, um, and that's true of eczemas, it's true of inflammatory acne or any type of uh, inflammatory condition. So um, uh, that's important. If you've got somebody who, for example, with uh, patchy pigmentation, um, sometimes you have to go with uh, systemic treatments for a short time to get the eczema under control. And sometimes ultraviolet B is actually very effective in patients with skin of color, and it can make the um, uh, pigment more uniform. Um, but also you've got to be aware that it can also increase the pigmentation in hyperpigmentation. So it's really a bit of a juggling act and an art, but uh, we can help a lot of patients with um, uh, uh, skin of color and eczema. Mm. Okay, uh, so someone's asked, is eczema just another, sorry, 
Uh, is contact dermatitis just another name for eczema? Would you follow the same pathways for contact dermatitis as you would for eczema? Um, or do we need to treat it differently? Yeah, I should have pointed out that you can use, uh, eczema is one of the specific types of dermatitis. Dermatitis means any type of inflamed skin uh, that's, that's uh, caused by inflammation. Eczema is the types of um, specific uh, eczema that's gone through the stages in general that I've uh, gone through with acute, subacute, chronic, um, and contact dermatitis is very much the same meaning as contact eczema. So contact eczema is the same as contact dermatitis in reality. So yes, all of the studies and, and um, important aspects of contact eczema that I related to uh, is relevant to what we call contact dermatitis. The two terms can be used and often are interchangeably. Great, thank you. Um, so just a little bit about uh, plant allergens, um, kind of natural remedies again. Um, are there any key plants that would increase symptoms, um, as you mentioned about plant allergens? Yes, I think one of the most common ones are, are the primula variety and primula dermatitis or primula contact eczema is very, very frequent. Uh, and uh, for people, and some of them are varieties are in, in um, uh, certainly in indoor plants as well as uh, outdoor bedding plants. So yeah, be look at that. Um, some of the uh, heliobores uh, can also occasionally give problems. Um, there's a variety of them that can uh, give uh, problems, but those are the same, and any plant really can occasionally give a, um, a risk of an irritant or contact eczema. So just um, look at, if you, if you have a, an eczema on, the other interesting thing about plant eczema is, and contact eczema is that often people not only have it on their hands, they'll also, frequently get it on their face and eyelids and it's because of this where we touch our faces quite frequently and so we transfer the plant allergen or the allergen from any of the products or products that get onto our hands onto our faces so again that's one of the other uh, if you will detective uh, uh, approaches that, that we have to take when we're looking at this but literally any plant can occasionally cause uh, dermatitis, but probably the most common ones are primulas. Obviously, poison oak, poison ivy, uh, those are some of the ones that we see a little bit less in this country, but certainly in other countries. There's a lot of the plants that we're exposed to or were exposed to when we we're allowed to travel, um, uh, we uh, would be exposed to in uh, tropical countries as well. So, all of the above. Okay. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of connections between eczema and thyroid dysfunction? Um, this person says that they've always had bad eczema from her father's side um, and dodgy thyroids from her mother's side. So have you ever, have you ever heard of those two being connected at all? Uh, in general, not. I think that they're two common conditions and what you find with eczema, which is, I've pointed out, a very frequent condition, there's lots of what we call coexisting diseases that can occur. So in general, the main links with atopic eczema are asthma, hay fever, urticaria. Those are the most common links. But um, thyroid is less so, although if somebody has an overactive thyroid and they get uh, stressed because of that overactivity, that can make eczemas worse, that stress reaction. And certainly with an underactive thyroid, you can get skin dryness that can often precipitate um, dryness that can create worsening eczema, particularly in the older uh, individual. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, what's your opinion on um, LED for treating eczema? Because this person's asked, would LED photo phototherapy be an option using near-infrared 830 um, nm to help? I think we need more information on that. Uh, one of the problems with, um, if it's near infrared, I think the main thing to avoid is um, 
is to create more erythema. Now, our LEDs can be used to reduce inflammatory um, uh, skin concerns. So I have no reason not to suggest that uh, you try LED uh, on somebody, certainly with facial erythema, eczema. I don't think it's going to do them any harm. Uh, and certainly uh, it's worth trying. Okay. Um, can ingredients rich in fatty acids um, like GLA be effective to reduce inflammation? I'm not sure whether this person means topically or um, internally in the form of like supplement, but what's your opinion on fatty acids to reduce eczema inflammation? It's one of the old um, uh, stories from uh, uh, a little while ago, uh, sunflower seed oil, gamma linoleic, gamma linoleic acids, were shown to actually improve some eczemas. And again, very safe, and it's certainly worthwhile trying both as uh, um, uh, seed oil capsules, as well as sunflower seed oil creams and lotions. It's not going to do any harm. Um, there's been a lot of controlled studies over the years where there's been clues that it may help some patients, but uh, when you look at it overall, it's difficult to predict which ones, but certainly, perfectly safe and it's one of the dietary um, things that you can try as well as fish oil capsules in general for inflammatory skin problems uh, may well be helpful in some individuals. Great. Um, okay, lots more questions. Um, is hydrocortisone cream a good option for irritant or atopic eczemas? Well, it has the one advantage, 1%, uh, half percent hydrocortisone, is that you can buy it over the counter without a prescription. Mm. So it's therefore frequently used. I think the problem with it is that, uh, as I say, too vigorous or frequent use can cause um, uh, skin thinning, uh, mm. particularly on the face and in the skin fold areas. Uh, it can also increase uh, somebody's risk of developing what we call steroid worsened rosacea. Okay. Uh, and it can also create, because you're getting the skin atrophy, you can also get telangiectasia or thread vein. So it's less of a concern with 1% hydrocortisone, half percent hydrocortisone with the stronger cortisones, but it certainly can occur. So I tend to be, uh, I always suggest that the patients reduce the frequency as much as possible. And certainly uh, if I see a, a patient that's been using frequent hydrocortisone, uh, I will try and uh, persuade them to take a prescription for Elidel or protopic cream or ointments to try and substitute because you don't get any skin atrophy problems or rosacea related problems with that. Mm. One of the other things you can get with frequent hydrocortisone use is uh, um, infections such as folliculitis, hair follicle infections, so again, that would be somewhere that I'd be looking for an alternative. Okay. Um, similarly, the next question someone's asked, can you access the creams mentioned over the counter or prescription only? So it, it's a mix, isn't it, with everything you've, you've talked about? It depends on the product. Yeah, it does. It depends on the product. There are certainly um, uh, hydrocortisone half percent, one percent creams and ointments available over the counter. Um, and certainly for seborrheic eczema, uh, a very good ones so that's uh, the combinations with um, uh, some of the anti yeast agents such as uh, nystatin hydrocortisone combination so that's a very good uh, combination for somebody to try and get hold of non prescription some of them are available dactacort for example um, which again I have no shares in but they um, they're, they're available over the counter in some uh, pharmacies so those are the sorts of things to look for. And then what I'll often do prescription wise is for example, if they've been using a lot of those, I'll substitute something like Elidel or Protopic ointment, which they'll mix with Nystatin cream or ointment and apply the mixture. And that Nystatin will help to reduce the uh, growth of the skin surface yeasts, which is very important, particularly in facial, <coughs> in facial eczema. Mm. Okay. Uh, so someone, someone's asked, again, uh, mentioned a few um, natural products specifically, and I imagine, I know what you're going to say, that there's 
probably not enough evidence um, to support the use of these things. But someone said, for those who don't react well, uh, the topical prescription treatments, what are your thoughts specifically on aloe vera, coconut oils, honey-based products and celery juice? Uh, I think that the answer is that providing that they're not create, that they don't create a problem. If anybody, it's unusual that uh, you can't find the correct T well tolerated prescription mm. topical product for a patient yeah. um, but you're right that sometimes um, if they've not seen a dermatologist they won't have been given these uh, different choices so some of the other um, agents that have been mentioned they're very good as additional um, skin protectants moisturizers and so yes I, I think absolutely what I usually suggest if somebody if a person has a history of reacting to a number of different products, get them to apply the uh, product either through a small area on the back of their hands or a small area behind the uh, ear or on the neck, just to make sure it's not going to make it worse. Okay. Um, oh my God, you've got so many questions. Okay. Well, it's good that they've been listening or working <laughs> or, or thinking about the about eczema, so happy to see, yeah. see the number of questions. Yeah, it's fab. Um, okay, so someone on Facebook asked, is there anything that, that can improve um, impaired barrier function? Yeah, very good, very important question. And actually the, um, the, the correction of the damaged skin barrier is one of the most important ways of approaching eczema. So in addition to the, uh, if you will, the therapeutic uh, creams and so forth, uh, plenty of emoliation, moisturizing washes, avoiding soaps and detergents, uh, avoiding irritants. If you do that, the skin actually has a, a very rapid repair system for its skin barrier. So what the key is, is to stop further damage to that skin barrier and protect it with some of the products that I've mentioned. Some of the moisturizing lotions that they can use in their shower or baths, trying to put, uh, if they've got facial eczema, put a moisturizing cream on the face before uh, they shampoo, because some shampoos, there obviously are detergents and irritants, that can create a problem. So protection to help the skin repair its skin barrier is very practical and, and the way to go. Mm. We haven't mentioned anything about sunscreens, because some Again, quite a few of the ingredients coming into hopefully more of the summer weather. Uh, some of the, and now we're allowed to be outside, um, some of the uh, sunscreens can irritate the skin. Actually, that might be another good subject for another webinar is, uh, is uh, the best use and selection of sunscreens. So yeah. again, get them to test uh, the sunscreen in an area before they start putting it over their whole skin with the person who has a history of eczema. And some pa patients who won't tolerate with eczema some of the um, alcoholic lotions and gels that will sting them. So mm. get them to use a, a, a nice moisturizing lotion vehicle uh, as their sunscreen. So all of these things are good ways of trying to protect the damaged skin barrier. Sunlight, of course, by damaging the skin and stimulating increased skin shedding will also damage the skin barrier further. So that's another important factor uh, mm -hmm. in the exposed skin, particularly in the summer months, uh, is to get a sunscreen that the uh, patient can, can tolerate. Mm. Okay. Um, I'm probably gonna say this word wrong, but someone has asked, would you recommend the same treatments for eczema on ichthyosis, if I said that right? Yeah, that's, no, you got it right. Ichthyosis. Ichthyosis are a group of uh, conditions that have uh, um, scaling skin, uh, most without inflammation. But interestingly, there are some of the eczemas, uh, some of the ichthyoses that are increased in incidence with atopic eczema. Uh, generally, the treatments uh, are different in that you don't need the anti-inflammatory treatments for ichthyoses that you need for eczema, but they also have an impaired skin barrier. So some of the moisturizers and emollients and the avoidance of soaps and detergents and other drying agents are very 
common to the two conditions. So there's some overlap with treatment approaches. Yeah, good question. Okay, fabulous. Um, uh, yes, Paula, I can, we will send the link. Um, don't worry. Um, let's see. Um, are Protopic and Elidel brand, are they brand creams or are they clinical names with many brands using them in their products? Well, there's only uh, two approved at the moment. One is Elidel, which is cream, which is called Permicrolimus, which is its chemical name. So Elidel is the brand name. And the other is Protopic, which is in two strengths, 0.03 and 0.1%. They're in an ointment base, and that's Tacrolimus. And that's, uh, uh, again, the Protopic is the brand name. So the, those are the two specific ones that are available. I think we will, as I've said in my last slide, have some newer non-cortisone creams coming along. Uh, one is close to approval. Uh, certainly in the United States, and I think we'll be getting uh, it here hopefully uh, before long. And they're the uh, JAK Janus kinase inhibitors, which have some advantages, uh, certainly over the cortisones. It remains to be seen whether they have advantages over the uh, Elidel protopic group. Okay. Um, so just on, on the SBF thing again, someone's just asked, are there any specific brands that you recommend for to avoid like eczema to avoid irritation on someone who does have eczema not really i think you're much better going to what some of the main brands uh um aven ombre solaire uh those some of the uh, main brands such as that um i would suggest going to one that has if you've got if you're advising or if you have a tendency to eczema go to one that is um formulated and says it's for sensitive skin um, and so look for those sort of uh, types and, and don't be afraid to uh, get see if you've, they've got a tester available so you can test them on your skin wait a few minutes test the skin uh, before you buy it and wait a few minutes to see if it stings uh, some uh, sunscreens uh, people can't tolerate on their foreheads because they get stinging of the eyelids and eyes so these are all things to Try and find one that the person or yourself tolerates and stay with it. No need to keep jumping from product to product because that increases your risk of uh, sensitivity. Okay. Um, in your opinion, is there a role for ceramides in maintenance of eczema between flare-ups? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I was suggesting some of the uh, moisturizing products, the cream products. Um, I think uh, I, I will often, as many of my patients who have eczemas of the face and hands, uh, between flare-ups, we get uh, dry skin. And uh, that can be uh, certainly important to improve that because that helps to reduce the relapse of the eczema. And things, as I've said, like CeraVe lotion and creams, the uh, dermal uh, ranges, uh, Dipra base, uh, some of the um, uh, those type of, uh, of, of products are, are very helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any surfactants in particular that you would recommend people stay away from? Well, I think the problem with surfactants are that they actually do degrade the skin barrier, and I uh, th that's how basically some of the soaps and detergents work. So. I think what you need to do is try and avoid them wherever possible. And certainly um, if you've got a tendency to a hand eczemas, particularly try and minimize contact. And as I've said, use the moisturizing washes and lotions and creams before you use the um, antimicrobial cleansers we have to use. So I don't think there's any particular one. I think it's just the group that will create problems with the person who has eczematous risk okay so i've got about one minute to go before i have to run oh god okay sorry i had no idea no, no that's fine what but what I'll, what i might do nick is there are quite a few questions left 
um, if I pop them underneath this video on Facebook, I might ask if you could come in at another time and perhaps just answer them on there. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Okay, yeah. cool. so should we just do one more? Yeah, um, and then if the, if the audience uh, need, uh, had some suggestions on further webinars, like the sunscreens, like the recognition yeah. of what pigmented uh, skin lesions are safe to treat and what they need to refer and update on acne, all of those sort of things. I'm yeah. happy to think about that. Absolutely, let us know. Um, okay, so let's just do this one more. This will probably be quite a quick one. Um, so someone has been an aromatherapist for nearly 20 years. She's never had a problem before, but now when she massages with blends, she gets contact dermatitis afterwards. Would this be a cumulative effect of exposure to the chemical constituents? Sorry, what did she use? So when now she's an aromatherapist. Yes. And when she massages, she just says with blends. So I'm not sure which um, oils are in there. Ah, she, I see. She's yes. getting contact dermatitis afterwards. Right. Well, there's several possibilities. One is that for reasons that we're not quite sure, somebody can have been exposed to the same agent for many years. And then for some reason, they eventually develop uh, uh, an allergic reaction. Sometimes that's because maybe part of their skin was more damaged when they were applying it for temporarily and more of the allergen actually got in through the skin barrier and created the allergy. So it's not uncommon to see that. And certainly it'd be worthwhile seeing a dermatologist with her oils that she uses and uh, to do patch testing to try and find out which ingredient or which oil. The other thing that can happen is that without her knowledge, there may have been a subtle change in the formulation that she's been using. Mm -hmm. And that can also be the reason because she's actually then exposed to a new ingredient that she wasn't aware of. Mm. So a number of, a number of possibilities. Mm. No, testing is a good idea though, definitely. Um, okay, you need to run. Thank you so much, Nick. That was brilliant. Um, no, my pleasure. And I appreciate the audience listening. And as I say, be happy to answer any questions and help but further. Well, well if, and if your question hasn't been answered, I will pop them underneath the Facebook video on the um, PB Facebook page. This will also be posted on the AM Facebook page. Um, and then I will ask Nick to just come in and answer some of those questions in the comments when he has a chance. Um, lots of comments saying thank you so much, Nick. People found it really, really in informative and thorough. Great. Um, super interesting. So I will let you run. Thank you so much for joining us with for this. Um, Fab, thank you everyone for watching and for all your questions and we will see you soon for our next webinar thanks georgia thanks nick speak soon bye bye bye, bye.